so far to Harbor Wolf. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our sand. Well, 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 what's going on in the world of space news today? Well, to be honest, quite a bit. The first Artemis mission to the moon is well underway, SpaceX is preparing Starship for its first orbital test flight, and much, much more. It may be a little hard to notice in the oversaturated world of social media, but we are most definitely in the middle of another space race. While the long-term goal is development of Mars colonization technology, in the short term, man will return to the moon and commercial spaceflight will become viable. Let's see how close we're getting to those goals. First, let's take a look at something that NASA announced recently, return missions to Venus. Earth's hellish sister planet has been more or less unexplored since 2004, and the last few spacecraft that visited it were merely doing flybys during gravity assist maneuvers toward other destinations. The last NASA spacecraft to fly by the planet was the Parker Solar Probe in 2018, though it merely used the planet to slingshot itself further toward the sun. Otherwise, Venus has remained on its own, a mysterious and hostile world that we understand very little about. However, very recently, NASA announced two new missions to Venus, and shortly afterward, ESA also announced their own Venus mission, giving us a total of three to look forward to. The first proposed NASA mission is Da Vinci Plus, which stands for Deep Atmosphere Venus Investigation of Noble Gases, Chemistry, and Imaging Plus. Catchy name as always. As the name suggests, Da Vinci Plus will send both an orbiter and a descent probe to Venus, with the descent probe traveling through the Venusian atmosphere to sample it and give us a better understanding of the origins, evolution, and differences of it as compared to Earth. Before the probe reaches the surface, it will take several photos, and these will be the first images of Venus's surface since the 1981 landing of the Soviet Venera 13 lander. To achieve these goals, Da Vinci Plus has a suite of instruments on its descent probe, referred to as the Venus Analytic Laboratory, a design based on that of the Curiosity rover currently on Mars. Da Vinci Plus's four science instruments are a mass spectrometer, used to survey gases in the atmosphere, a laser spectrometer, a more sensitive instrument that will answer questions about the upper clouds as well as near the surface, an atmospheric structure investigation tool, which will study the atmospheric structure and allow for precise reconstructions of the probe's descent, and the Venus descent imager which, you guessed it, will take photos of Venus's surface. Intending to happen just before Da Vinci Plus launching hopefully in 2028, and likely to be used to assist in its descent, NASA also announced the Veritas mission, Standing for Venus Emissivity, Radio Science, INSAR, Topography, and Spectroscopy, Veritas is an orbiter that will have the goal of mapping the surface of Venus with high-resolution instruments. The goals of Veritas are to determine how Venus's geology has evolved over time, what geologic processes are currently operating on it, and whether or not water has ever been present on or near its surface. Considering the planet's similarity to Earth in terms of size, age, and composition, this will hopefully answer questions about how planets form and help predict how and when a planet can become hospitable. Announced shortly after these two missions, ESA announced Envision, an orbital mission that also intends to provide high-resolution radar mapping as well as atmospheric studies. In addition, Envision will utilize a radio science experiment that will use tidal deformation and motion of the planet in place of seismic data to determine geological data about the planet. Moving on to other NASA plans, let's talk about SLS. Standing for Space Launch System, SLS will be, when launched, the world's most powerful rocket ever flown including the legendary Saturn V moon rocket. SLS has seen a long and complicated development history that has caused a lot of criticism to be leveled at it, especially now with companies like SpaceX seeming to be moving much faster, unburdened by the restrictions that NASA deals with every day. However, SLS is finally getting in gear. On Friday, June 11th, engineers at Florida's Kennedy Space Center finished hoisting the SLS core stage, turning it upright, and placing it into its launch configuration between the two solid rocket boosters. This is the first time SLS has had all three key elements put together in their launch configuration. NASA plans to launch SLS on its maiden flight, Artemis 1, in November of 2021. This flight will be an uncrewed test flight to send the Orion spacecraft on a 25-day mission, six of which will be spent orbiting the moon. Assuming the success of this mission, Artemis 2 will launch in 2023, carrying a crew of four into lunar orbit in preparation for the assembly of the Lunar Gateway, a small station intended to serve as full lunar landing missions. NASA's current plan includes using both SLS and Orion combined with a lunar variant of the SpaceX Starship, intending to give man a sustainable presence on the moon. This will not only allow long-term research about the moon, 
but will also lay the foundation for sending humans to Mars. Now, let's move on to space tourism. This is a field that is currently moving very quickly. Virgin Galactic completed their first suborbital spaceflight recently using the Scaled Composites Model 339 Spaceship 2. Spaceship 2 is brought to a high altitude by a plane called the White Knight 2, at which point it detaches and fires a rocket engine to reach a suborbital trajectory. At this point, Spaceship 2 returns to Earth as a glider, much like the NASA Space Shuttle did, and performs a conventional runway landing. The most recent flight reached an altitude of 89 kilometers before falling back down, meaning it was technically below the Kármán line, but we must remember that the boundary of space is a thick gradient. It's still incredible progress, and before we know it, people like us will be able to book a flight like this for a fairly reasonable price. Moving right along with Virgin Galactic, Jeff Bezos, owner of Amazon and Blue Origin, announced that he himself would be a passenger on the first full suborbital flight of the new Shepard rocket, which Blue Origin has been working hard on for several months now. Bidding occurred yesterday, June 12th, on other seats for the same flight, with one passenger paying $28 million for his seat. Despite facing extreme criticism, you have to respect someone willing to strap themselves into their own rocket for a flight that has questionable chances of success. In addition, a private company called Axiom Space has been preparing to create a market for orbital space tourism. The company recently purchased three SpaceX Crew Dragon missions and plans to expand the International Space Station with habitable modules for supporting tourist crews, including a large windowed module for viewing the Earth from space. Planning to launch the first module as early as 2024, Axiom's modules will be connected to the forward docking port of the Harmony module, which will require relocation of one of the station's pressurized mating adapters. Axiom also plans on facilitating a flight for actor Tom Cruise to film several scenes for a movie that I assume involves space travel, though few details have been released. The final piece of space news I'd like to take note of today has to do with Starship clones. Now I'll preface this by saying, I don't mind. It really doesn't bother me that other designers are picking up cues from SpaceX. To be honest, they may be jumping the gun, as Starship is far from its final configuration. It's currently little more than a tin can meant to test the efficacy of the SpaceX Raptor engines, as well as perfect the techniques needed for landing after orbital re-entry. That being said, it's pretty clear where some agencies are getting their inspiration. First comes China. The CNSA recently unveiled an artist concept for a reusable orbital rocket, and the design looks suspiciously familiar. However, this isn't even a prototype. This is just a design on paper. And it's not like China is any stranger to stealing designs from other nations. It's kind of what they've always done. I mean, for instance, here's an image of China's Tianwen-1 Mars rover next to NASA's Opportunity rover. Corporate espionage is a hell of a drug. The other company apparently taking cues from SpaceX is Relativity Space. They recently unveiled plans for two rockets, both belonging to a family they're calling Terran. The Terran 1 looks an awful lot like the Falcon 9, which, if you're going to steal from SpaceX, good on you for stealing the one that's quickly proving itself to be extremely reliable and cost-efficient when compared with single-use rockets. However, the other Terran rocket is the Terran R, which is quite obviously inspired by Starship. Its design, though, contains one detail that gives me extreme cause for concern. Of course, this is essentially a design concept, but the second stage is something that I would consider a big problem. This stage is powered exclusively by a single Aeon vacuum engine, and intends to be able to land itself. With a vacuum engine. Allow me to explain the problem here. Two-stage rockets have a very predictable and reliable structure. The first stage consists of higher-powered engines that are specifically designed to be used in Earth's atmosphere, delivering higher thrust to push the rocket out of the Earth's thickest layers of atmosphere. Once in the upper atmosphere, the first stage is dropped, and the rocket will switch to what's called a vacuum engine, which is usually smaller, lighter, lower-powered, and designed specifically for use in low-pressure environments. Remember that. They're designed to be used in the upper atmosphere, and in the vacuum of space. When they're back on the ground with 14.7 psi of air pressure around them, they're not particularly effective. Allow me to demonstrate using Kerbal Space Program. You already saw how the game's swivel engine functions at low altitudes, designed to push a basic two-stage rocket into the upper atmosphere. However, let's now remove that first stage and try to launch only the second stage using its Terrier vacuum engine from the launch pad and see what happens. It doesn't move. At ground pressure, the Terrier engine simply cannot produce enough thrust to lift the rocket into the air. 
Once it's reached sufficient altitude, the air becomes thin enough that the engine is able to function and continue pushing the rocket higher and further. So my point is this. I simply don't see how the Terran R is supposed to land its second stage with a vacuum engine. Maybe this is going to be changed later, or maybe the second stage engine isn't a true vacuum engine and can function both in space and at sea level. This isn't impossible. The Space Shuttle's RS-25 main engines, for instance, were able to both help lift the rocket off the pad and put it into a nearly complete orbit in a vacuum. Hopefully Relativity Space will have this figured out once the Premier flight crashes into the ocean because it's trying to slow itself down using the equivalent of an air compressor. So, all things said and done, the space race is beginning to move quite quickly. It started off slow, but test dates are coming up fast and progress is starting to be made. We're going back to the moon, we're going to Mars, and everyday people are going to go to space. Read it and weep, Flat Earthers. If you like this video, please give it a like. If you want to see more, please subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications. If you want to support me further, consider becoming a member or a patron or checking out my merch or my Amazon links. Thank you and I will see you over the curve, Space Cowboys. In a vast cosmic arena. self-importance, the delusion that we have some